Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, the California Ag Land and Water Market Outlook, the decade ahead. We're really excited to uh, spend this hour with you all during lunch or whatever you may be doing to uh, bring some expert perspectives from uh, foremost experts in the real estate agricultural market here in California and the water market as well. Um, we're going to give everybody a couple more minutes to log in, um, and then we'll get started with the webinar. But if you don't mind, and if you look to your right, uh, you will see a, a poll section here, and I'm going to be adding a poll to this here. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with us uh, kind of what industry uh, you all represent, it would be great to get a feel for who all is in the room and participating with us today. Thank you all so much for your responses. As a bit of an overview and an introduction, again, thank you all for joining us today for our webinar. Um, for those of you who are a little unfamiliar with Demio or the platform, you'll see to your right a chat box or button. So feel free during the course of today's webinar and conversation, if you have any uh, questions or would like to send anything over here uh, for the speakers and us to consider and respond to during the course of the webinar, do please feel free to do so. And again, if you're just joining us for the webinar, we've also posted a poll. And if you wouldn't mind sharing with us which, rep which industries you represent, uh, that would be great. So a couple other housekeeping items today's uh, presentation and, and demo session is going to be recorded. Um, so for those of you who perhaps aren't able to join us for the entire extent uh, who are, or would like to share this event with others, we will be sending a link to the to the event recording to all registered attendees. And I believe uh, we'll also be uh, posting a YouTube video of this as well uh, through Shul and Associates. <clears throat> Now, I think it's time to get started with introductions. Again, thank you all for joining us. My name is Bryce McAteer. I'm with Westwater Research. We are a water resources consulting firm. Uh, I'm based out of our Sacramento office here. And joining me today are our two speakers, expert, experts in the agricultural real estate market and the uh, water resources management and water market, um, Mark Schul and Matthew Payne. Um, Mark, if you wouldn't mind, perhaps just start us off with a brief introduction and, and introduce yourself to the crowd. Sure. I'm a real estate broker. I'm uh, living and headquartered in Visalia, California. That's between Bakersfield and uh, Fresno, San Francisco and LA for some. Uh, anyway, we're, uh, we're headquartered there, but we're licensed. I'm licensed in 12 different states. We've got a staff of 16 people. Our focus is clearly agriculture and being in uh, the heart of the new Sigma guidelines, we're, uh, we're seeing the impact and we're going to share some of that today. Thanks, Mark. And Matt, how about introducing yourself as well? Certainly. Thanks, Bryce. Hi, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. My name is Matt Payne. I'm a partner with Westwater Research, and I lead our California and Arizona consulting practices. And Westwater specializes in water markets. That's what we do. We um, value water rights and water assets. We help clients transact uh, water rights and water storage. Uh, we advise on deal structuring and execution. And um, we also have uh, a uh, proprietary database that supports everything we do and gives us some expertise on what's happening in the water market. It's a database of water transfers and prices that are being paid for water transfers. Um, and so we leverage that information base to provide clients the best advice we can on pricing water assets and structuring transactions. So I'll be bringing perspective as someone who's um, trading in the water market and helping clients to buy and sell in the California water transfer market. Thanks so much, and thank you both uh, for those introductions. Again, all of you today, we're hoping for a fantastic webinar. We're gonna bring some great expertise and perspective here to the conversation about what to expect in the decade ahead. Um, 
But really how I want to start this off, um, you know, most of you are aware of the challenges facing uh, agriculture as well as uh, water users across uh, California, particularly in the Central Valley. Over the last couple of years, as the Sustainable Groundwater Management was originally passed in 2014 and now is being implemented in many locations across California, folks are really thinking ahead in the next five, ten years about what's going to happen, how our water supply is going to change, uh, and complementing that, of course, are ever-changing regulations. Uh, more volatile hydrologic conditions, um, which are affecting everybody who relies on whether it be the Central Valley Project, the State Water Project, or even local water rights and ditch company shares. So, um, you know, to start off, I'm going to allow each of our experts here to provide us with a little bit of perspective on what they think are kind of the three big challenges, opportunities, or trends that they foresee in the decade ahead as, as folks in the real estate market and the water market anticipate you know, what, what, what may be happening in these areas and how can they plan ahead, optimize their position, and continue to participate in the, uh, in the agricultural real estate and water market in the heart of California's agricultural um, Central Valley. So I think, you know, Mark, I wanted to start with you, actually. Um, water availability is, of course, critical to um, an agricultural operation and, and likewise critical to the value of a, of a piece of land. But I wanted to ask you, you know, as folks are beginning to see the effects of Sigma and thinking about it both from what you've observed uh, over the past uh, couple of years here and thinking ahead into the future, I mean, what kind of impact is water availability influence having on agricultural land in the valley, in the state? And are, is this being uh, distinguished, you know, anywhere in particular or are all the regions kind of moving with the same motion? It's a lot of question. <laughs> First of all, thanks again for inviting me. I do appreciate being here. Uh, I can add that uh, Matt is very diligent in gathering data, so their the proprietary database is very solid. But yes, thank you. Um, First of all, uh, water is key, uh, and it, it, it turns out California is a pretty big state, so we'll try to uh, offer you generalities, but it really needs to be drilled down to the specifics. So uh, I guess that's my disclaimer. Um, so, uh, I, I sell farmland. I've done that since 1983. That's a long time. Uh, I now tell people that I sell water, but you have to buy the farm ground to get the water. It's, it's really flipped that much. It's a big deal. Water uh, and water availability, uh, water security, all those things have changed my world. And kind of gradually in 2014, when the law was passed, you think it would be more dramatic, drastic. And then really 2015, 16, 17, people didn't really believe it. They can't take my water, whoever they is, uh, right? But now uh, with the uh, uh, groundwater sustainability agencies, the GSA submitting GSPs, their plans in 2020, there's really some meat to uh, what's happening in, in California in water. And every groundwater uh, sustainability area has a different plan. And part of our job, part of our buyer's jobs, our seller's jobs, is really to understand those plans and what that means for their property. Um, and so it, it's made a big impact. And I'm going to give some real big overviews once again. Um, in my, my humble opinion, the difference between having uh, good groundwater and good surface water, there's about a 50% spread to not having surface water. So if land in a good ground water area, good, good surface water, good soil, all things being equal, might transact for $25,000, $30,000 per acre. We've had instances where across the road is uh, the boundary for groundwater, I mean surface water being available. That price might be 50% of that face value. So it's, it's dramatic. That's, uh, once again, a, a broad statement. Uh, but it, it makes a big difference on the surface water. All our institutional buyers, those who have sophisticated staffs and teams, will request or require two source water ground. That's just the parameter that's been laid out for their investor base. And if it does not have two source water being groundwater and surface water, it's more complicated than that. But that is the, uh, the biggest factor in that. And then regionally, uh, we talk about the east side of the San Joaquin Valley, having a little bit better water sources, uh, more reliable, uh, anyway, usually a higher value than the west side of the valley, which will might, might be more sporadic, uh, certainly deeper well depths, 
uh, might be a million dollars to put in a well, might be uh, on the west side versus 300,000 on the east side of the valley. So those, those differences are east, west, and then north, south, typically the further north you go to so get closer to Sacramento, you get out of the critically uh, critical uh, areas for sustainability and the, the different priorities, which are not as impacted and therefore the price is not a significant difference. But so north south makes a difference. Also, some of the best water districts in the San Joaquin Valley are in Kern County in the southern part of the valley and are highly sought after. So once again, it is certainly area specific. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, east side of the valley is worth more than the west side. Uh, uh, north side sometimes has less productivity as far as crop production, but more water. And there are offsets to that. Does that help? <laughs> oh, that's great. Right. I appreciate okay. you sharing that with us. And uh, no, I, I think the regional distinctions are, are important to consider for, for folks who may be in the market. And what are the uh, uh, what are the gives and the takes as you look at a particular piece of property? And, and especially as some of these GSAs begin to implement their Sigma plans, you know, what does that mean to the groundwater available to you? Um, you know, and I guess that kind of leads into my next question. As we start thinking about cropping patterns under Sigma. I mean, we've seen permanent crop acreage, particularly as a result of the expansion of almond acres, and a little bit more recently, some pistachio acres. You know, that's really exploded over the last 10 years. Um, and, and so I wanted to ask you, you know, thinking about the next 10 years, where water supplies are, what's happened on the project systems, um, and, and just what you're hearing from buyers. I mean, um, are we going to continue to see that same rate of expansion? Do you think there are other market opportunities and say the, the row crop, annual crop side of things to um, help offset perhaps the loss of available supplies? You know, what is kind of the future of, of cropping in, in the Central Valley? Yeah, Bryce, great question. Because uh, cropping patterns are really, a lot of it's a math problem and probability problem. And uh, we kind of like those things around here because <laughs> there's it's new things to talk about. And uh, the buyers typically are quite sophisticated on that, but they don't know. Uh, so I had lunch yesterday with an institutional investor. They own tens of thousands of land in, uh, in, in California. Uh, and we talked specifically about that. And they have, uh, they're ahead of the curve. They've been setting aside land as we call a fallow ground but that's a misnomer it's not fallow uh, they want to plant it so if you're planting if you're spending seven to ten thousand dollars per acre to develop uh, open land to permit plantings and that crop will live almonds 25 years before you might replant pistachios 80 years 100 years i don't know right you, you need water security for that entire time and so one way to do that is plant only a portion of the farm to permit plantings and leave another portion available to fallow and use that water for the permanent plantings. That's the concept behind it. But it turns out every year is different. And so we have dry years and wet years and California gets a lot of publicity on that, right? We have our big droughts and fires or whatever might be the case, but really there's planning that goes behind all of that. And so the, the but the modeling that is done, the financial modeling is complex. So are you counting on two out of 10 years being wet and two out of 10 years being really dry? And there's historical data for that. Of course, then there's climate change and people's opinions on that and probability and modeling for that. So the goal is to make planting decisions for that fallow ground as soon as you have an idea of what that year looks like. Because you, you don't really know you have a dry year till virtually today, March, right? Uh, uh, April 15th, you need to have certain crops in the ground, whatever it might be. So, or you leave it fallow and don't plant it and save that for uh, that the pumping rights for that prop portion of the property on your permit plantings. So it's a, it's a math problem. It's a, it's not overwhelming. Your company turns out to be really good at math, <laughs> West water. Um, Thank you. And, and also the water security, a big part of it, of course, and the number one priority of that is water availability. You need typically three to four acre feet per acre on that permanent planting. Uh, if you're not planting the land right next door, the fallow part zero, but maybe, uh, you know, there's all kinds of different crops with different amounts of, of water. So, um, uh, but the other part of it is not just availability of that water, but also the price of that water. Uh, I talked about two sources of water, groundwater and surface water, but surface water is more complex. Many districts will allow you to buy supplemental water, uh, one word for it, or additional water from other areas. What's the cost of that supplemental water? We call that the incremental water cost for the last acre foot of water used. Uh, you can pay the most for that on a permanent planting. 
but you don't want to lose all your profit by keeping that tree alive or that crop coming in. And so there's ways, I'm gonna give a pitch to Westwater here, I hope that's okay, to hedge those positions. Uh, and that's key to planning. So if you're making, it goes back to the question, what are your cropping patterns? What cropping decisions are you making? If you have not hedged those positions uh, on water cost, you are less likely to plant that fallow ground. If you have a well-protected position at a reasonable price, you are more likely to make those planting decisions in February, March, April uh, to bring that crop in in August, September, October. So it, it's a, it's a, it, we call it challenges, we call it opportunity, but it, there's, there's, people are making those decisions and making them with good information and good data. Wow. Well, that's really helpful, Mark. And I guess, uh, you know, really the third question I had about that is, well, we talk about perhaps changing cropping patterns, and a lot of that, too, has to do with just what's going on in the agricultural and commodities markets. But, um, it, you know, there's been some conversation about perhaps alternative streams of revenue or alternative land values. Um, and you personally, when I uh, kind of worked down in the, uh, in the Tulare County area, um, as agencies, we're working to think about how are we going to incentivize folks to recharge water supplies. We need to address this groundwater issue. Um, the, the lens through which folks start to uh, identify value in, in a property has begun to change a little bit. It's not just the farming value, but also if I have a really sandy piece of soil, perhaps that could turn into a recharge basin. Or um, are we talking about perhaps switching out uh, what was previously planted here with uh, solar panels or something else. I mean, as folks start to think about optimizing or, or converting or, or perhaps even retiring some of their agricultural land, you know, has that been at the forefront of the discussion now? Have you heard from buyers, you know, uh, a different way of approaching a, a land acquisition and how they're choosing to kind of optimize their, uh, you know, 640 acre section or, or something like that? I mean, what are folks kind of thinking about as they look to optimize or, or potentially change the way in which they manage the land? You used the word in their forefront and caught my ear just briefly. I would say it's not at the forefront. It's, uh, it's almost disappointing that it's not at the forefront. It's coming, but it's not there. So a lot of the buyers think of it second, third, two, right? They want, can I recharge? How do I recharge? How do I bank water? Uh, there's real no mechanism. Sorry, you guys, <laughs> you guys don't correct me on it. There's not a great marketing mechanism for recharged banked water. Uh, in most of the GSAs. Uh, they don't have a good plan for that. Uh, I just, I'm closing an escrow here coming up. Uh, the water rights are pertinent to the land. You cannot sell the water rights off. And so we, did, we weren't transferring any document to transfer water stock. But the district says, oh, time out. We have, uh, we have some customers who are banking water and those are transferable rights. You need to make sure if those rights go with the property, don't go with the property. So there are things that are changing. We're all learning, right? Figuring that all together, but it, it's coming slowly. Uh, the sandy soil is easy. What is not e e for recharge, excuse me, right? That makes sense. People look at that, oh, an opportunity. Solar is easy. That's, that's a big part of what's happening in the Valley. Uh, so people are looking at that. Uh, but what they're not looking at, uh, is the, the value of land and the safe yield that you can pump from that ground, although you have it fallow. So if all I own is a poor piece of ground and I don't want to farm anymore, and I'm thinking of selling it, what is that ground worth? Well, if I'm right next to a pistachio grower who's thinking, oh my gosh, I planted acre to acre, wall to wall, I may not be able to irrigate my whole orchard in the future. What is that fallow piece of ground next door to that pistachio farm? worth for pumping rights. Now I'm not talking about moving water from one farm to the next. I'm talking about no wells on the fallow ground and allowing the person with the pistachio farm whose GSP, the plan states that in the year 2025, we'll probably have some restrictions on what you can pump. And that might only be nine inches of water and that tree takes two and a half feet or three feet of, of per acre of water. And so where do I get the extra water? And that might be from the neighbor's piece. So what's the value then? It, person's piece. The, yeah, not much value has gone into that yet. It's coming. And so that's, I think, huge opportunities too, right? Because there's a, there's a lag in that value and that opportunity. 
Definitely. No, I think you're so right. And I, I think the market's still working to price that out. And particularly as a lot of these districts and GSAs um, start to really implement their GSPs and work through those issues of allocations and transfers and, and how to achieve sustainability, we'll probably see a lot more clarity on that. Um, so I really appreciate you kind of walking us through the, the big picture on, on those key trends. And you know, I think that's a great segue, Matt, to uh, kind of talking about uh, very specifically the water side of things and talking about what we may expect in terms of how water markets and management um, both uh, have been working out in, in the past, but also what to expect here in the future. And I know you've put together a, a couple of charts and slides for folks. Um, and just as a reminder to all of our attendees, thank you for all your questions. And I'll be reviewing the chat box here when we get into the Q&A session. So please continue to, to submit those. Um, but yeah, Mark, Matt, um, Tell us a little bit, you know, give us a brief overview of, of California's water market and kind of what you've been seeing and, and what you expect here over the next couple of years. My first slide here, I'll start to give you my perspective on what we're likely to see in the water market in the decade ahead. So California obviously has a lot of water challenges and water resource challenges. If I have to pick two that are probably the most important and impactful, it's first of all the decreasing reliability of surface water and one metric for that is you can look at the state water project allocations the chart on the left side of this slide gives the five-year running average of those allocations and you can see since 1990 that five-year running average has decreased pretty significantly which indicates deteriorating reliability of surface water now the second challenge I would choose is Sigma, and Mark um, addressed some of the issues around Sigma with respect to water supplies and land values, but the uh, map on the right side of the chart shows where Sigma is really going to have an impact. Um, Sigma was enacted in 2014. It is intended to begin the process of managing groundwater pumping in areas where historically groundwater has been overdrafted and there hasn't been a lot of regulation around pumping. And the hotspots in this map are really where we're going to see that regulation have an impact in terms of reduced pumping. And it's, um, you know, some of the highest value agricultural areas in the state, if not all of them. So that's going to be a really severe challenge that we have to grapple with moving forward. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, what this means is we have more permanent crops with less groundwater. The figure on the left side of this slide shows um, acres harvested of fruit and nut crops, so permanent crops in the San Joaquin Valley since 1989. Back in 1989, we had under 800,000 acres harvested. 2019, we had almost 1.8 million acres harvested. That's huge growth in a land use that has a high and extremely inflexible water demand, but is also a very high value use of that water. Now, concurrently with those demands growing and becoming less flexible, we're facing uh, what's shown in the chart on the right, which is a decrease in groundwater pumping. I've lifted this chart from an excellent report that the Public Policy Institute of California prepared, looking at the regional economic impacts of Sigma in the San Joaquin Valley. And the columns on the right show um, total groundwater pumping compared to the reduction that's anticipated in groundwater pumping. You can see those reductions will be concentrated um, on the southeast side of San Joaquin Valley. Um, southwest side of the San Joaquin Valley and then also in the Kern River Basin. And in total, PPIC is anticipating reductions of about 2.5 million acre feet of pumping per year. Now this slide is intended to put some numbers around the trend that Mark did a great job of describing. Um, this information is from a excellent publication that the uh, American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers publishes every year. It's called their Trends Report and it gives some of the best information that you'll find on current land values in the various regions in the state. Now, these are a couple of examples from just two counties in the valley. So we've got Fresno County on the left, Madera County on the right. Um, the charts in green show the range of estimated market values for land within water districts. So they have district water. Uh, the red lines on the bottom are the range in values for cropland in white areas, or they're mostly groundwater dependent areas outside of water districts. So what you see back in 2015, land within a water district and in a white area largely traded at about the same range. For example, in um, you know, Fresno County, it's a wide range, about 10,000 an acre to just shy of 30,000 an acre. Now that ground within water districts, uh, the value has been relatively stable, if not increasing some over the past five years. In contrast, values of land in white areas 
have decreased pretty substantially. And what we're seeing there is the value of that water supply is getting quickly capitalized into land prices. I don't think we're all the way there. I think those um, wide area land prices are gonna continue to soften, but um, that is a trend that we're gonna see more of as Sigma really takes effect is the value of having water or not having water is capitalized into the price of your property. Next slide, please. So this is another summary of the analysis I mentioned that the Public Policy of Institute of California did looking at the regional impacts of Sigma in San Joaquin Valley. Now, looking at this table, the um, column that's uh, second to left is what happens from Sigma by 2040 with inflexible local water use. So if we don't have the ability to trade water around through market transactions, if we have limited ability to switch crop types, we're gonna see 2.5 million acre feet of applied water reduction translating to fallowing of 780,000 acres. So if you do the math, it's a little over three acre feet per acre and lost crop production revenue of 3.5 billion annually. And that's a really severe and kind of scary number. Um, if you move to the right on the table, you can kind of see the benefits of water trading. So moving to the right, if we have some amount of local water trading, that 780,000 fallowed acres become 750,000, and we're only losing two billion a year in revenue instead of three and a half. Now that local water trading, like Mark said, is being talked about in a lot of the GSAs. There's really a lot of interest in figuring out how to flexibly move groundwater allocations around within the basins. Most basins haven't figured out how to do that yet, but there is a lot of interest in it. And I do anticipate we'll see more of that happening in the near future. Now, further to the right, if you, lay, if you layer on um, surface water trading throughout the San Joaquin Valley, in addition to local water trading, now the economic impact is only 1.3 billion a year in lost crop production revenue. So that's a really strong incentive for water marketing and a really significant benefit for being able to flexibly manage water and then on the far right, if not only are we able to trade water, but we're also able to develop some new supplies, then you get to about a billion dollars a year in impact. Now compare that to the 3.5 billion number on the far left side of the table, that's a two and a half billion dollar reason to start trading water. Next slide, please. So this figure shows the total volume traded annually in the surface water market. We have in most years, as you can see, between 600,000 acre feet trading and 800,000 acre feet trading per year. About half of that is under spot market or one-time trades and the rest is happening under multi-year trades. So already there's a lot of water changing hands in the market. What a lot of policymakers um, will say is that if we're able to implement policies and regulations that make water trading easier, reduce the barriers to trade, we'll see that number go up. I would contend that we're gonna see that volume traded go up anyways, um, no matter what the policy says. Um, the players in this market recognize the importance of water trading. They're becoming very sophisticated about it. One example, we're starting to see um, water districts get concerned about the regulatory process for completing a spot market trade. So what they'll do is negotiate with the counterparty a multi-year agreement, say a 15 year agreement, and that agreement will be moved through the regulatory process. So you have regulatory approvals to transfer water for 15 years. Now the districts and the buyers and sellers won't have agreed on a price, they won't have agreed on a volume. They'll get together every year and negotiate that. They'll already have the regulatory clearances pre-approved. So it's ingenuity like that um, that we're starting to see. And that's why no matter what the policy says, we're gonna see more water trading in the Valley. And this chart just illustrates the prices we're seeing. The um, dark blue line is average annual price. The vertical lines are the range in prices. Basically what this is showing is that every time there's a drought cycle, we go through a really significant process of price discovery. The market's getting repriced. Buyers are saying, what am I willing to pay to keep um, you know, my almond or pistachio trees yielding? And the sellers are starting to say, what am I willing to accept to idle some of my um, forage or field crops? And that's the uh, process you see. Um, we've seen prices as high as $2,000 an acre foot. You know, whether those prices become the norm in the future, um, you know, that's an uncertainty and time will tell. But I do think we're going to see continued price discovery as more and more folks enter this market and begin to trade. So just to recap my perspective and my, my thoughts on the decade ahead, um, you know, Sigma and other water supply challenges are creating strong incentives for water trading to the tune of two and a half billion a year in crop revenue. Um, I think all San Joaquin Valley growers should expect and plan to be trading water just like they buy and sell any other input or output. 
Some, some growers are doing this already. Uh, water supply values, as Mark mentioned and as I mentioned, are, will be eventually fully capitalized into land values. We're going to see water trading expand throughout the valley with or without new enabling policy. And then we're going to continue to see more price discovery as this market matures. And we're also going to see new approaches to risk management. Those are physical approaches, groundwater banking, for example, and also uh, financial products, different insurance or derivatives products will be introduced into the market. So that's my perspective. Thanks, Bryce. Yeah. Well, thank you, Matt and Mark. Thank you both for uh, for taking us through kind of what you uh, anticipate to happen in, in the years ahead, as well as some perspective as kind of what we're seeing today and have seen over the last couple of years. Um, I think this has been really, really informative. And um, for all of our viewers, again, a reminder, we're going to be entering a, a Q&A session right now. And so while I do have a couple of questions just based about based off of what we've talked about here, um, I also acknowledge a couple of you guys have been uh, submitting questions there in the chat box. So please continue to do so. And I'll take a look at uh, the questions that have been submitted and try to uh, refer some of those here to, to Matt and Mark. Um, but I guess, you know, the first question that I have, and, and Mark, I think maybe I want to start with you on this one. Um, California really has a unique Mediterranean climate, and it's been a fantastic place uh, to, to grow just about every single crop you can think of. I think last time I checked the, uh, the Department of Food and Agriculture's uh, annual report, we're growing over, what, 400 different crop types in the state. Um, but with all the different you know, regulatory and water supply challenges uh, that, that we may be facing here, while California has been a great place to, to grow your family business or perhaps to, to deploy capital as an investment entity, um, do you think California is going to continue to peak to continue to compete as a place to, to deploy new capital? Are there other areas that may be taking precedence or be uh, you know, taking, some, uh, taking some of that market share in terms of where folks want to deploy capital for agricultural investments in the next couple of years? Good question, uh, complex. Uh, I'll set my bias. I'm very much an optimist about California. So <laughs> just uh, lo looking at it through that lens. Uh, we do have one, one segment, the uh, dairy industry that uh, has really moved out of state and could do that in other climates with other uh, capital improvements, curtains on a barn uh, in the cold. And, you know, anyway, and we've seen a big flight of dairies out of California to other agriculture regions. The diversity and the climate, and I, I even think Sigma is all a benefit to long-term growth in California. We do need to to sustain our aquifer. That is key, that's gonna happen. That'll, um, I think, offer stability in the long run. Uh, we won't be competing with our neighbor to drop deeper and deeper wells to put our straw on the ground to pull that water out. Uh, so I, I, I do see uh, capital coming in California, but there are competing areas. So our rents per dollar invested, rate of return to the investor, uh, if you're looking at it as a, just a strictly a rent plate, I buy the land, I rent it to a tenant, the tenant pays me rent. What's my rate of return? We typically do not fare well uh, when competing with the Midwest, um, corn, soybeans, those rents, the land prices typically follow commodity prices, although there's a lag and a lot of variables. Those rates of return are fairly stable and very consistent and a good source of diversifying for that purpose. Our rents do compete when we do a, a percentage of gross crop or some kind of crop share basis because we have such high revenues and that offers some protection to both the farmer and, and the investor. So if almond prices go way up, the rent goes way up. Right now, almond prices are down. If you're participating in a percent of crop, then the farmer as the tenant has some safety valve and that they're not paying as much rent. So there's some flexibility there, but uh, really we are, finding capital from an operational standpoint. And what I mean by that is investors want to operate. They want to be the farmer. Now they hire professional farm management companies to make that all happen, but they are taking the market risk. They are taking the farming risk. Uh, I've heard it stated, we are, we are factories without a roof. Right? We have climate, we have weather, we have problems, right? Things happen, um, but there's also great rewards in the kind of diversity and the, uh, the specialty crops that can be grown here including, you know, you know, we talk about permanent crops. I talk about it's being all about nuts. Vegetable crops can make tremendous rate of return. Garlic, I was told, is, you know, when you rotate it on a four-year cycle is tremendous, right? I learned that yesterday at, at lunch. Uh, so there are multiple crops and, and um, yeah, the diversity is welcomed by investors that 
you're not pigeonholed into one crop, one avenue to go. What if things fail in this area, you can go to another area. So I am I'm huge, huge fan of California. I think the capital will continue to flow in. That's great. Well, thanks, Mark. And, you know, I, I guess um, thinking about another question, and, and Matt, I want to throw this your way, but um, you know, when we talk about water transfers and the water market, you know, um, the water transfers have been around for, for quite some time. We can think about it very thematically, just transferring water through projects from one region to another, uh, but also really the market-based transactions that I think folks are really keying in on in terms of, you know, what's the price per acre foot I need to pay to get that last increment of water? Um, you know, what have you seen over the past 10 years, we'll call it, in terms of the makeup of participants in the in the water market from from urban buyers to ag buyers um, and maybe walk us through a little bit too about what these transfers look like from both the market type ex, uh, transfers to exchanges one for one two for one and what all that means and how folks have utilized those and and what you think about you know uh, how things may transition in the years ahead sure so i'll, I'll start with the um uh, who are the players piece of that question and how has market participation evolved? So the water market in, in California and really other parts of the Western US too um, started in a couple of ways. So uh, informal trades among growers on the same ditch system or river system were very common. Those continue today. Um, in terms of larger transfers that received more attention, we had this paradigm of reallocating water from agriculture to urban uses. So primarily from lower value sort of forage crops to high value urban uses, that was really driven uh, by urban growth. So for a long time, we had um, new people flocking to Western cities, population was growing. Those people happened to be quite thirsty. They liked their swimming pools. They didn't have water efficient appliances. So water demands were going up and the water managers in those urban areas were procuring water to accommodate growth. Now, the last five or so years, the picture's changed. Um, we don't see these large urban water agencies competing in the spot market to acquire water during dry years. Um, you know, those urban water agencies are really more focused on long-term solutions to reliability. And I say reliability because their focus really has shifted away from accommodating growth. Water demands aren't growing the way they once were. In fact, in a lot of areas, they're declining. But water reliability is becoming a more severe problem. So urban water agencies, instead of going and procuring water from um, alfalfa farms, they're developing groundwater banks, they're developing recycled water projects, surface water storage projects, some of the longer term, more structural solutions are really the focus. In terms of market-based transfers, um, we've seen permanent crop growers step into the shoes of the water agencies that have left and really become the primary buyers in the market for water transfers. So really the most bulk of the transfers we're seeing are from growers who have really secure, highly reliable water rights and maybe are using those for um, forage crops or field crops, transferring that water to um, permanent crop growers during dry years in areas that are pretty severely groundwater short. So that's really been the shift in market participation on the buy side. You know, the, the urbans have largely left and the ag users have stepped into their shoes. In terms of the types of trades we see, um, you know, the, the simplest type to think about is just a spot market, sort of a one-time transfer of water. We see those in wet years, we see those in dry years. Interestingly, uh, wet year spot trading activity has really picked up and that's largely motivated by Sigma. Um, as districts and growers, uh, sort of um, looking out on the horizon and see the impacts of Sigma coming down the line. They're procuring as much cheap wet year water as they can and recharging it into the basin. Um, it's really more cost effective than uh, competing with other buyers during dry years, um, although we do still see some of that. So in addition to spot market trades, we're seeing uh, multi-year transactions. We see um, a lot of flexibility around those and, and increasing flexibility. So. One of the models that we've seen more and more is the buyer and seller will strike a multi-year contract. They won't say much other than this is a 15-year contract and we'll get together every year and figure out the price and volume. That gets the regulatory issues pre-approved and then every year they're free to transact as they wish. It makes, uh, makes transactions a lot easier and reduces transaction costs. We're seeing more and more of those flex flexible mechanisms um, emerge in the market. Um, and then, you know, another big change that's happening um, on the state water project system, the state water contracts are getting amended. Um, 
to allow more flexible trading of water. Uh, on the state water project system, if you wanted to trade water, you had to do it through an exchange mechanism, usually an unbalanced exchange. Um, they really limited the movement of that water. Now, uh, buyers and sellers on the state system are able to do multi-year transfers, single-year transfers, a lot easier than they used to. So that's a big change that's happening in the market as well. Wow, so those are some major innovations. And yeah, I think those state water project amendments too for, for folks who uh, are keying into that or have been tracking it, um, you know, unlike some other projects, like Matt said, uh, the state water project really hasn't uh, allowed for as flexible uh, use of transfer um, mechanisms among its participants. And so uh, hopefully this will be a great tool for folks to move those supplies around. Um, I think, Mark, I saw a couple of questions in here in the chat box about just you know, different districts and other things. And you know, thinking about how uh, folks are coming to you and, and talking about, you know, where should I be investing in land? Where should I be finding a new property? Um, you know, to what extent are they also thinking about um, not just, you know, what location is best suited for the crop I want to grow, but perhaps what's the reliability of this district's surface water supplies or, you know, what really is the groundwater situation here? And what can I expect once these Sigma plans get underway? I mean, how much are folks focusing on that in terms of, you know, the overall uh, uh, purchase and transaction? It goes back to water security again. Um, I, I just listed a property in the, uh, the Lone Tree Water, Mutual Water Company, I think it's called, between Los Banos and Merced. I've not dealt in that district for, if ever, that I can recall. So. I make the call to the, the water manager. George there was extremely helpful. I pulled up the GSP, which is, you could find those on site, figure out which one is the right one. I read what their plan was for the next five years. Uh, and really what I need to get to is, will there be a secure water source for the next 30 years, right? Kind of thing. Because if you cannot plant permanent crops, the land won't be worth as much value. In this case, the the manager is very helpful. There is no what we call a safe yield. Uh, familiar with that? How much, how much water can you pump from the aquifer? There is no limit in their GSP for the next five years. It will be reevaluated in 2025. That's the way it works to see if the aquifer is maintaining itself or if they have to be more restrictive. So right now there, there's always a, we think we're in great shape, but right we might have to implement something in the year 2025 that we were not anticipating we are putting in all kinds of infrastructure they are they're doing across canal uh they're they're uh, working on recharge projects they're buying water during the flood years they have a plan and that plan is to maintain their aquifer and they will likely be successful once again it gets down to probability what is the probability of that and what is a buyer willing to risk given that factor and uh in this case i think the probability is quite good and, and the neighbors on two sides of the property are planting pistachios. So they are betting on, we will have groundwater for a very, very long time. But getting solid data is the trick because if the GSP does not state what specifically what the restrictions might be, it's like, we're gonna think we could fix this through other sources, buying water recharge on and on, then you don't know for sure what the next five years might bring. And that's true at any of these GSPs. They all get reevaluated five years out. And so that the security water question is, is key. It's key to value. It's key to making the planting decision. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, Mark, I want to jump off of that and, and thinking about water security and, and managing those risks and particularly kind of how uh, growers can start to hedge against um, water unreliability, really. Um, Matt, as we look at GSPs, as we look at different tools, um, you know, I think there's two things that, that kind of come to mind now. One is groundwater banking or, or groundwater recharge and opportunities for that. And while the policies in many areas are so nascent, you know, I was interested in kind of how a landowner could, could use groundwater banking perhaps as a tool. And also, um, you know, this NQH2O index that um, has been going on for a while, but recently in December, I understand, you know, CME has lost a futures product around that. Perhaps you could speak a little bit more about those two things. Uh, groundwater banking is a fantastic risk management tool. Um, it, it's really a way to store water underground relatively cheaply when it's available during wet years and extract that water during dry years when it's needed. Um, it is not high tech. You're spreading water out on um, a, a 
highly transmissive piece of ground overlying a dewatered aquifer, um, letting it infiltrate. And then when you need the water, you're using wells to recover it. Um, you know, it's interesting. I saw a uh, in the chat call um, a question about um, does Westwater think any new storage will be developed in the next 10 years? Um, I would say yes, and it's going to be underground water storage um, primarily. So that that's really where the focus of uh, a lot of growers has been. Um, we need more banking capacity. Most of the groundwater banking projects in the valley and, and elsewhere, frankly, um, are fully or oversubscribed. And there's a lot of interest in developing new new projects. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, the, the players in this market are very sophisticated. So when they hear about a trend like Mark and I described about, you know, land without good water uh, decreasing in value, but land with good water maintaining its value, the first question they ask is, hey, how can we pick up some of this lower valued land and um, connect it with the water supply solution to bring up the value? And groundwater banking is one of the primary uh, ways that, that folks are looking at doing that. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced it pencils out yet under current land values, but I expect it will. So um, you asked also about the um, NQH2O California Water Price Index and water futures. Um, so that's kind of the first example of one of these non-structural sort of non-infrastructure based solutions to water risk. Um, First of all, the price index is exactly that. It's a price index that's posted and published weekly by NASDAQ, gives you an indication of what's the current price for a spot market transfer in dollars per acre foot. It's intended to provide price transparency and just one tool that buyers and sellers can look to when they're negotiating price. Now, the CME listed cash settled futures contracts, just like any other futures contracts that settles to that water price index. So now um, growers have a way to go to that futures market and if they anticipate needing water in the upcoming season, they can take a long position in those futures. If the um, price of water goes up, um, that futures trade will produce a gain or a positive revenue for that grower that they can take and then reinvest into the water transfer market. Now, it's a, it's a useful tool, but it's an imperfect tool. It doesn't provide delivery of water to your farm when you need it in the quantity you need it, but it is one step toward having a hedge for this risk. Um, that's really what it's intended to do. Um, when you need water, it'll provide a payout that you can use to go procure that water. And if you're a seller of water, it can help you manage your revenues from water sales uh, year to year. Now that's really helpful. Um, and you know, I, I think as we consider how to manage these risks, there's going to be a lot of innovation in the next 10 years. And some of that is going to be uh, complementing new policies that GSAs or irrigation districts put forward. Um, but I also want to ask, Mark, you know, as buyers are looking at um, different parcels of ground across the valley, have you gotten a sense that there are uh, different things that buyers versus sellers are discounting or, or different ways in which perhaps local buyers versus institutional buyers are looking at a piece of ground. I mean, kind of give us a feel for um, how folks are looking at these things differently and, and if you expect there may be some convergence down the line. Sure. Uh, there's a clear difference between the types of buyers and, and certainly difference between buyers and sellers and motivations and so forth. So between institutional buyers, which really have come to California with a with zeal over the last five years, seven years, uh, versus family farms that have sold to family farms, right? Some families are worth a lot of money. So some of those are pretty big. They feel like corporate farms, but they really are family farms. The, um, the, typically the institutional investors are very analytical. That's great. They spend a lot of money being analytical, hire appropriate consultants. I'm sure you benefit from some of that. Um, but they are also painfully slow from my perspective in making a purchase decision and things disappear, right? I mean, they, the family farmers quicker, faster, swifter at making those purchase decisions. Uh, the larger institutional investors, because they do spend quite a bit of money through the due diligence process, need fairly large uh, economies of scale. Uh, statements like uh, $10 million is our minimum, $15 million. Well, it's hard to accumulate. We're talking about a 40 acre block a lot of times, right? <laughs> they want 4,000 acres, right? Those, those are uh, monumental decisions. And so that's a little bit of a difference between uh, buyers and sellers. Uh, the, the farmer next door knows the farm. They know what they want. 
they're not doing a lot of analysis. But they, as as property owners, sometimes they're not as knowledgeable about these water issues, right? Uh, some some are passionate about it; they know way more than I'll ever know. But a lot of the uh, traditional family farmers um, are slower to come to the table on the realization that the uh, sigma might regulate their pumping abilities. And some have made planting decisions that don't reflect what is likely to happen. Once again, probabilities likely to happen, may not happen, but could happen to their property as far as ability to pull four acre feet out of the ground to irrigate those trees. That's just not likely to happen in, in most of California over time. Uh, but there are business decisions being made around that. Uh, I'm going to run up with this for the next decade. I'll have this farm paid for based on this permanent planting, and then I'll figure it out later. But, but generally speaking, that's not the attitude that, that is rare. They're, everybody's looking at water and the probability of water and what to plant and what to do. So, hey, uh, uh, I do want to add, Matt, uh, I, over the, just the last few weeks, I've learned about some sophisticated in, sophistication and recharge. One, uh, uh, my friend Jeff Fabry in Kern County, they're doing, uh, basically they're putting in systems to recharge underneath the tree, a reverse drain, we call it. And it sounded very promising. And then I talked to another friend in, on the west side in Westlands Water District, or, uh, and they're doing uh, the storage recovery program where they're using their deep wells to run water backwards um, at a cost, right? And to retrofit and quality water, all those things are key. There's, I think, a 2019 white paper that he referenced to me I had a copy of. I've not read the whole thing. But there are some innovations coming to recharge because not everybody has or every district has good sandy soils for recharge. So. Yeah. No, I think that brings up a really important point. I mean, as folks continue to innovate, it's great to see you know, folks like Jeff Fabry working on those sorts of projects and things. You know, I really wanted to maybe close this off as, as in thinking through the lens of, of water markets and particularly groundwater markets. Um, Matt, you had mentioned earlier, you know, water markets or transactions have been uh, around for, for quite some time. And uh, Mark, you're, you're familiar with this uh, very well, too, working with kind of the local folks in terms of, hey, I got I have some extra ditch share water. I want to trade it this year. Um, but in some cases, folks are apprehensive around, say, groundwater markets or GSAs developing these new markets. And I was wondering if you could share some perspectives on, um, you know, we just talked about banked water and developing recharge facilities and if there's value there. Um, Matt and Mark, maybe both of you, Matt, you can begin. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on the development of these markets? Why are they helpful? Why are they important? And what are the opportunities for folks? And um, how do they or don't they compare to historical, uh, you know, coffee shop transactions and what we've done in the past? Sure, I can start with a few thoughts. So. Um... When, you, when you're talking about um, local groundwater markets, you know, for, first, um, the benefit, right? So if groundwater pumping is going to be constrained by some regulatory limit or cap, um, there's benefit to, first of all, deciding who gets what share of that cap and then allowing them to trade that around the basin. What that allows is for reallocation of the available cap to the most valuable uses of that water. And so, if you are a very high valued user of water and you find yourself um, with less water than, than you otherwise need, you have the ability to mitigate that by acquiring water from someone else. Now, if you um, have a lower value use of water or you know, say you're just ready to retire because Sigma is really a pain, um, you have the ability to develop a revenue stream from that water. It adds a new asset to your portfolio that otherwise was just the bundle of sticks in your property but was tough to separate out now have a new asset that on its own is marketable. And so that creates some of these um, savings in terms of lost crop production revenue, and we'll see less, less acres coming out of production if you're able to move that local groundwater around. Um, so, so really in my mind, that's the benefit. It's a way to mitigate the effects of a new regulatory shortage. Um, and um, yeah, I think um, in terms of your other piece of the question about I think you were alluding to more formal markets, right? So there are a lot of folks out there who are saying, oh, we can put these trades on a screen and reduce transaction costs by connecting buyers and sellers just, you know, over the internet. Um, you know, I certainly think there's some value there and I think that will happen eventually. 
Um, but back to my initial points, with or without that capability, these trades will happen. Um, buyers and sellers will find each other, they'll connect, they'll make that reallocation happen. It's the job of the policymakers to make that as easy as possible. Thanks, Matt. And I mean, Mark, as you work with folks, and, and maybe we can finish this up here, but as uh, you hear buyers and sellers talk about the, the incoming water markets, or perhaps they maybe already work in a GSA where these water markets have, have been implemented, you know, kind of what are you hearing and, and how are folks integrating that into their day-to-day -day practice? Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer because it's, it's really, I would call it a premature question almost because it's not being very well implemented. Um, and another one of our agents come in, what about this district? Any shares available for sale? My answer is there won't be shares available for sale. Everybody is holding on tightly. This is the price, but it's not going to transact. If you were hoping to get those shares, it's not likely to happen. So sorry. Uh, groundwater trading and shares is coming. And I have lots of friends and clients. We love to talk about, oh, I have a sandy spot. I put in a recharge basin in 2017. I put it in, but they're monitoring it themselves. They're hiring their own water engineers locally to calculate the, it's an easy math problem. Once again, what the, what the recharge amount was. The districts are just now, and it really districts are different than GS, uh, uh, A's, are coming up with policies and plans. So this can all come about, but I have not seen really very much as far as my groundwater goes to you kind of trades. Um, it has to happen. There's, if you're going to restrict the groundwater pumping, you just created a market for the land that doesn't pump. And so it's coming and that will the value of that land will capitalize. But I will tell you very little land is being capitalized based on that value because there's very few trades. So it's companies like yourself who are educating and enlightening and showing the way uh, that will help us get there. And, and not just for the farmer and for the buyer and the seller and institutional investors and all that, but every one of these irrigation districts has a manager, everyone, the, the multiple districts form together to form the, the agencies, they all have a manager and they're all busier than bees trying to get through all this. And they need, they need help to figure out the next step. And they're just trying to figure out how to not overdraft their aquifers. The next step will be the, and it's coming, the marketing of that, those groundwater shares. If you choose not to pump, how does that work? If you bank it, do you get credit for that? who participates in that groundwater, whose water is it? Uh, the district wants a share of that for tax, for management, for, there's just a lot in it, but it's coming and we should just flat plan for it. Yeah, no, that's a really great point, Mark. And I appreciate you sharing that. And, and I think for folks listening and particularly those who are growers and who operate in these areas, um, you know, what you just said here that there, there are managers in each of these districts, they're still working through the rules. That's a really important thing to consider. And uh, in, in many cases, I think, you know, we would anticipate that these markets or these transfer programs will likely be a big piece of how folks manage through Sigma. Um, but for growers, for local stakeholders, it's also really important to get involved because you can help craft the rules that then you'll be living with and operating with um, and, all, and, and managing your farm with in the years to come. And so I think that's really important. There are ways to innovate. And you know, perhaps if you grow in one district and want to bring an idea to another, you know, share those, those ideas and, and help folks cross pollinate from place to place. And you know, that'll allow you to, to manage through Sigma as well as live with the rules that you're hoping to live within. So I think that was a really great point, Mark. And you know, I, I want to end on a, on a light note here. You know, we've talked about some of the challenges. We've talked about um, uh, you know, what we foresee and what we got to be working through. But uh, maybe you can leave, each of, uh, leave all the attendees here with, with an opportunity. You know, what is the opportunity that you see from your perspective in the decade ahead? Uh, Mark, you know, start with you and Matt, maybe let you finish up. Yeah, there's opportunities through all this, right? The, the land values, I think, are going to continue to increase. Matt, you said the same thing. In those areas where, where water is plentiful and the surface water is good, it's transacting a fair amount now. But there's also going to be um, land that goes down in value. As, as it, the perception is true, I don't have any water to plant anything, right? What do I do? I'm going to try to sell my, what little water I might be able to pump. So uh, the, the graphs that you showed, Matt, were very helpful. The, the, uh, some land will continue to go up and some, some land will continue to go down. And being aware of those uh, times, right? It might be the time to sell some of that single source water and jump into some of this better ground. It's a two for one trade right now. That's not an easy trade, but I still think that's an opportunity.
I'm bullish on California agriculture and water, despite some of the challenges we've talked about. You know, I largely attribute that to the sophistication of the players in this market, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of groups that are already going out and building a portfolio of ground with two water sources uh, that's planted to say a forage crop, uh, along with the ground with one water source that may be in permanent crops, and then finding a way to exchange water within their own operation um, during different year types so they have the resources they need. Um, and I just think those types of opportunities are going to be more and more plentiful um, as this market develops. So, um, you know, overall, I think there are lots of ways to mitigate sigma, lots of ways to mitigate water supply variability. And, um, you know, there will be some pain felt, um, but I also think there will be a lot of people who, who benefit from those, those solutions. Thank you guys so much. No, I think those are, are some great things to keep in mind as we consider the decade ahead. And, and thank you both for your uh, time and participation in today's event. For all the attendees here, we appreciate you joining us here for the last hour, and, and we hope that you come away uh, feeling a little bit more informed and feeling like you had a good productive lunch. Um, again, Matt and Mark, you guys are, are experts in your field, so thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your time and expertise with all of us here today. Um, for those of you listening in, just as a final reminder, you'll be able to re-watch this webinar if you'd like or share it with your friends. We will be sending out a link to all of you who have registered, and we'll also be working with Shulin Associates to post a YouTube version of this online so you can access that and share it as well. Um, there were a plenty of great questions we saw in the chat box, and sorry if we couldn't get to yours specifically, but our contact information is provided in the, uh, in the slide below. So feel free to give all of us a ring, shoot us an email. We're happy to clear anything up or, or chat with you on the phone. Or if you have a question or would like to work with any of us, do please feel free to reach out. And we'll also work to share uh, the handout that was presented here today as well. So again, thank you all for your time. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And we wish you a great rest of the week. Thank you.